The nice thing about evolution is that it really makes biology make sense. Actually, just the notion of evolution is so vague as to be meaningless. One of the more amusing things is to hear people say evolution is just a theory. Well, in scientific terms, a theory is the most certain thing you can have. Should it be taught? Of course it should be taught. But uh, not to teach it as a fact. At some point they had determined that we had banned the teaching of evolution. Uh, that didn't happen. There's been more evolution taught in the public schools than ever before because people started asking, well, what is this really all about? And why, why is there such a controversy over this? the teaching of evolution under attack in Kansas. Betty Ann Bowser reports. It was a simple majority vote, but it sent shock waves around the world. The state board's actions on this issue immediately attracted international attention and widespread ridicule. Some people thought that the media exaggerated the extent of the board's actions in regard to evolution. The chair of the Department of Secondary Education at Kansas State University Larry Sharman made note of such tendencies. At some point they had determined that we had banned the teaching of evolution. Uh, that didn't happen. What did happen is more subtle than that though, and I think if, if somebody actually reviews that section, what you're going to end up seeing is that it's more the treatment of the nature of science and the na nature of theories that is the real crux of where I have the biggest problem, and as a consequence, if we accept the way that they wrote the nature of a theory, then the nature of, of uh, evolution as a theory, uh, as a consequence to the state standards that follow, are going to, to not, not be acceptable. It is a theory, and that's another problem. It is a theory, and, uh, but the common parlance of the word theory means that this is conjecture, this is a guess. In science, we mean something very different when we say a theory. And let me give you an example. We still call the idea that uh, bacteria cause infectious disease, we still call that the germ theory. Does anybody have any kind of a question about that? Of course infectious disease is caused by bacteria and viruses. We still call it a theory because that's the way we deal with a big batch of internally consistent observations. Uh, theory of gravitation. Lots of things we scientists call theory and we know what we're talking about. Um, but the normal population, the, the rest of the world, outside of our laboratories, um, when they say theory, it's like, well, no, it's an interesting idea, but it's just conjecture. Well, that's not what is meant by uh, the theory of evolution. Evolution is to biology what the periodic table is to chemistry. Uh, as the periodic table organizes the elements and their properties and you can figure out what's going on in chemistry based on the periodic table, so does evolution do the same thing with biological variables. If intelligent design Eugenie Scott is the director of the National Center for Science Education, a nonprofit membership organization that serves as a clearinghouse for information on science education and the teaching of evolution. She was invited to present a public lecture at a congregational church in Lawrence by a newly formed group called Kansas Citizens for Science. With a doctorate in biological anthropology, she acknowledges the complexity of evolutionary theory. But the basic big idea of evolution is really graspable by, by anyone. Um, the basic big idea of general evolution is that the universe has had a history, that galaxies and stars and planets and life on Earth has changed through time. Uh, that's a historical statement. In the case of biological evolution, the specific subfield of, of evolution, the big idea is that living things shared common ancestors, that we are descended with modification from common ancestors with other creatures, and all creatures are related in this way. That is a fairly simple idea, the essence of which can be communicated in, clearly enough in, in junior high. 
in senior high, uh, students deserve to know more about the details of evolution, not just what happened in the whole branching of this tree of life, but also the mechanisms and processes that scientists have been studying to try to explain how it is that this change through time, this descent with modification has taken place. So there are various levels that you can approach evolution, from a very simple direct one to uh, greater levels of complexity. Actually, just the notion of evolution is so vague as to be meaningless. This controversy also attracted University of California emeritus law professor Philip Johnson to Kansas. The author of a number of books, such as Darwin on Trial, Johnson contends that evolution is a theory in crisis. At the popular level... Well, yes, uh, the crisis of evolutionary theory has to do with the mechanism and what we understand today about the enormous complexity of cellular processes, of the, what you might say, the software that's needed to make the life processes run. And there, evolution is a theory that's just about change. And that's how it's defined. It's changes in gene frequencies or whatever. And you, you do get a certain amount of change. So in a limited, not very important way, the theory is valid. But what it doesn't do is explain the origin of the genetic information, the software, the program that makes everything operate. And that's the issue that is really leading it into a crisis. The theory of evolution provides a framework for conceptualizing the manner in which natural processes have contributed to the biodiversity found on Earth and continue to shape the world in which we live. In cases where it has become the subject of controversy, however, it's often depicted as a particular type of evolution involving common misconceptions. If you were to canvas the general public and just use the E word itself, the, the, the connotation is going to be human evolution common ancestry with apes, or even we came from monkeys. Uh, it, it, there's a subtle difference there in terms of common ancestry with something that was ape-like versus saying we're a direct lineage from. That, that's never been the case. In my line of work, I do a lot of radio call-in shows, and it seems like almost every single show somebody calls in with what they think is going to be the question that's really going to nail that smart alecky evolution lady. They say, if man evolved from monkeys, why are there still monkeys? And you just sort of sigh and count to three and explain very gently that someone has misled you about evolution because we did not evolve from monkeys. We and monkeys shared a common ancestor. And the whole nature of evolution has to do with common ancestry. We did not evolve from chimps. Chimps and we shared common ancestors. It's sort of like saying you evolved from your brother because you and your brother share a common ancestor and your dad, you and your cousin share a common ancestor and your grandpa. That's the relationship that is between us and chimps and us, us and monkeys. There's one theme to human evolution from four, five, six million years ago. That theme is information management. In anthropology class, we were all taught the difference between, and this is how this interview started, between animals and humans that the difference between animals and humans is that humans made tools and animals did not. Well, of course, now we know animals do make tools. Chimps make tools, gorillas make tools. But it's not tool making, it's not making fire, and it's not language, and it's not all that. It's, those are all symptoms of what the difference is. The difference is information management. Humans have always managed information better than any other organism on Earth, and managed it in such a way to ensure their survival and to ensure groundbreaking technological discoveries, um, whether it's fire or whether it's um, rockets to the moon. In anthropological terms, information management and technological change are components of cultural evolution, which can be conceived as an historical process in which increasingly complex societies have emerged. Although he's a biologist, Paul Ehrlich maintains that cultural evolution may be more crucial to our current situation than biological evolution. First of all, it's really important to understand that from what we can see, our cultural evolution goes at very different rates. So does biological evolution in, in uh, different ways. But the, um, the problem is that we, our ability to do uh, has changed much more rapidly than our ability to understand what we're doing and our consequences of doing it. So, We've gone in a few hundred years from a, uh, from a species 
uh, that had a, uh, an economy based on horses, you know, draft animals, carts, very simple machines, and so on, uh, to a society where you actually can show people pictures of someone who is uh, in action speaking, who's either not there or may even be dead. Uh, that's a very, very big change. Uh, our capabilities with, the, with things like nuclear weapons and biological weapons and chemical weapons and so on to kill each other, to destroy the world, uh, have become enormously greater, but we're basically uh, the same critters that lived in castles and uh, uh, fought jousts and so on and so forth. And that means we've got to pay a lot more attention to trying to accelerate our evolution in our ethics of how we treat each other and how we treat the environment, because in particular, because our technological capabilities to destroy each other and to destroy the environment have become so much greater that we basically have no choice. So we've got to stop leaving the decisions to the industrialists and the politicians, because only we can change the course of business by choosing ethically what to buy and what not to buy. And only we can cause the politicians to make the right environmental decisions if they know the people are behind them. But we don't have too long. I mean, there really are horrible things going on. I think it's absolutely insane if you think about the future of our species if we don't find ways to train every human being, to tell every human being the story of human evolution, where we came from, what our characteristics are so they understand that we evolved a nervous system that was not designed to deal with the kinds of problems that are the most serious ones we now face and that we have to culturally substitute for that. Uh, it's really critical that people learn to take a long-term view if they want us to be a long-term society and a long-term species, if they want their grandchildren to be able to live a life that's something like the one they live today, at least is nice. Glad you could stop by to see a clip from KTWU. It's your input that helps make public television great. Consider a donation. Browse over to ktwu.org right now.